Welcome to the Ghost of Harrod Hall. My name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for episode 89 of our chapter-by-chapter book review of Song of Ice and Fire by George Martin. Today, we'll be discussing chapter 15 of A Clash of Kings. That's Tyrion 3. And as always, we're going to chat about the chapter. We're going to try not to spoil any future plot points for you. And hopefully, we're going to provide you with some entertainment along the way. We'll summarise what happened, discuss our thoughts on it, provide some useful background, compare it to the television show, indulge in a little pedantry, and cover some reader mail. Be sure to check out the show notes. They'll provide some additional information that will be helpful, particularly if you're not reading along. How are you, McKelly? I am doing just fine. Uh, I... Uh, and all of those uh, of us who are on the uh, Discord server this week uh, know that you've got a, an interesting story for us. I do have a story, yes, yes. I teased this story on the Discord server. You did. And apparently I did a good job of the tease. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so yes, um, at the, the weekend I had my birthday, and I, thank you. Everyone on the Discord server was very nice about my birthday, so it was, it was very touching. Thank you. Um, and so for my birthday, I got to choose dinner. And so we had Indian food for dinner because I love Indian food. So I had um, sag paneer and naan. And I told this story uh, to my team and I have an Indian lady works for me. And I said naan bread. She was like, it's just naan, Simon. I was like, Uh. (laughs) sag paneer and naan. And I got it and I put it on the coffee table and I picked up my fork and I went and the dog started barking. And Nothing unusual about that. The dog always barks all right. the time for some reason. But <laughs> Lucas said, Dad, does that bark seem far away to you? I was oh, like, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so a gate had been left open. Uh-oh. And Penny was in the wind. Oh, no. Like, oh, no. So <laughs> we all dropped our forks. And we all went running outside. And, and it did actually, it was stressful, but it didn't actually take that long to find her. And she came trotting back and... No problem, but we got her in the house and we all breathed a sigh of relief. Right, sure, yeah. Which is followed by an inhale, which revealed that Penny had taken the opportunity of being out to roll in something (laughs) beyond foul. (laughs) She stank so bad. Uh, (laughs) My eyes were watering. I was like, oh, oh my God. (laughs) So, (laughs) So I picked her up, which was, believe me, that was a chore to pick up this dog. Yes. I was like, I do not want that any closer to me. I'm sure it was. And I carried her to the bathroom (laughs) and we have a sliding glass door shower. So that's the perfect place to clean the dog, you see, because also it has two advantages. One is the sliding glass door. So she's trapped. And the other one is it's got the shower head comes down. And so you can get down. Yeah. 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 So it's a great place to shower the dog. So, so I threw her in there and then I go in with her. This is your birthday, right? (laughs) This is my birthday. Don't forget this. This is my birthday. (laughs) So I, I shampoo the dog. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I just use I just use shampoo. I mean, I don't use anything special. I just get the shampoo and I shampoo right. the dog. Right, yeah, yeah. And I clean her off and I, I rinse it out. She still stinks, so I have to shampoo her again. I have to do it one more time. A double shampoo oh, It was, it was, oh God, it was foul. And so then the system is, what the system with the dog is, I leave the door to the bathroom open. Fortunately, it's in a corner of the house where people don't walk past, so uh-huh. it's good news. I- um, but I, I put three rag towels over the top. So when she's clean, I pull the rag towels down one by one and dry her off as best I can. Then I open the door, let her run out. Yes. Then I close the door and have my own shower because I'm covered in dog hair and detritus at this right. point. You know? <laughs> so so I, I have my own shower and I get out of the shower and I'm like, oh, God, what a mess. And so I go back. The dog ate the non No way! I was afraid <laughs> you were going to say that. <laughs> Lucas was so afraid that I was going to kill the dog that he discussed with Carson before I came out of the shower, telling him, telling me that it was him that ate the non I was like, <laughs> you don't want to take that bullet. <laughs> He's going to step in front of the dog and take the bullet for it. 
<laughs> when Carson told me that, I said, I flat out wouldn't have believed that because I, the boy knows me too well. He would not have stolen that naan bread. Why? Um, Why would the dog have eaten the bread? <laughs> because it was on the coffee table. It was. A, she was like, "Well, no one's looking. You know, everyone's like picking up towels and things." <laughs> she was like, "Wow." I really worked up an appetite. Hey, looky here. <laughs> yeah. I, also, I also fear that she was playing the long game. She was like, if I run away, I think I can get some of that <laughs> naan <right>. bread. <laughs> she had this whole thing planned out from the beginning. <laughs> uh, so that was my birthday. <laughs> oh, man. Happy uh, birthday. <laughs> yeah. Man, my cheeks hurt from laughing so hard. Uh, I knew I knew you would like it. <laughs> Oh, man. So, I don't know. Maybe it's a penny thing because my penny enjoys going out and rolling in uh, usually crap or something very smelly and then yeah. coming back as well. So, yeah. You're, you have the advantage of you can wash your dog in the sink. I mean, yes. you'll pick it up in your hand and just deal yes. with it. Very, very easy to clean off. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and she doesn't mind at all. She doesn't move or anything she seems to enjoy it oh well the other Wait. thing i promised to talk about on the discord server was to talk about the european super league but things have moved on so quickly there that uh, i ranted to mckelly before we started recording because yes we uh, spent uh, almost just, 40 minutes <laughs> it's, yes it's just, i spared you all this uh, but but i will say so the the the, the letters of the acronym for the european super league was esl and uh, the Guardian newspaper, which I, I read, um, has started to refer to that as um, the euro symbol, the oh. dollar symbol, <laughs> and the pound symbol, <laughs> which I thought was very clever. Yeah. It's the money. It was the money grab league. So, oh yeah, <laughs> it was that. All right, uh, let's get down to business. Well, uh, sorry. Before I say that, did you have anything? Uh no, no, nothing that can uh, follow that story. <laughs> so let's get down to business how did we leave Tyrion um, last time we saw Tyrion he was having a last supper with Janus Slint before the latter's unexpected elevation to the heights of the wall uh -oh. he was appointing Varys's recommendation of Je Jacelyn Bywater to lead the gold cloaks he was hearing more from Varys of the murder of the Baratheon bastards and talking to Bronn about recruiting more men to his cause why don't we give him the summary all right the small council, minus Varys and Jamie, I guess, is meeting to discuss the news of Stannis's claim. You know, the whole Joffrey is a child of incest and not a Baratheon, and therefore by rights he, Stannis, is the king of the Seven Kingdoms. Cersei is incensed and wants a blanket ban on the news. The other members of the small council point out that it might be smarter to treat the entire accusation with haughty disdain, which of course plays to Cersei's strengths. No, very much so, yes. Um, Tyrion notes that the the phrase in the light of the Lord wording in the letter. They know Solis has taken up with a red priest. They see this as another angle to use against Stannis. Get the church on their side and perhaps the small folk will follow. Littlefinger suggests that they spread an even more salacious rumour against Stannis. He reckons that the small folk care more about the juiciness of the gossip rather than its veracity. Solis Flor Florent is no looker, and Shireen is pretty afflicted herself. Maybe Stannis is a cuckold. They consider possible fathers for Shireen, and land on the fool patch face, which rather fits with Shireen's own, own facial affliction. Right. Littlefinger smartly suggests that he use his brothels as ground zero for the Stannis rumors, and Tyrion is quite impressed. Tyrion then leaves with Bronn, and they head to the Tower of the Hand. Tyrion's shy page, Podrick Payne, you like the alliteration there? That's good. Helps him dress. Uh, then Tyrion meets with a representative group of the city's armorers and blacksmiths. He commissions a huge chain to be forged. He wants the furnaces burning night and day. Some complain, but he assures them that they'll be given every bit of aid possible, and if they don't want to make chains, they can wear them. From there, Tyrion and Bronn head to the brothel of Chitaya, uh, notably independent of Peter Baelish. That's right, yeah, we, we know that that one is not owned by Baelish, yeah. Right. Ch Chitaya pre presents the wares of her house, and Tyrion selects Ch 
Chitaya's own 16-year-old daughter, Alayaya. She explains that in the Summer Isles, lovemaking is pleasing to the gods, and many young noble women spend a few years in brothels honing their arts. Tyrion likes the sound of this religion. Alayaya leads him to a room in the upper f on the upper floor. Within, she shows him to a wardrobe with a false back. He passes through the wardrobe and soon comes across a small fawn known as Mr. Tumnus. Oh, wait, sorry. <laughs> sorry, wrong story. <laughs> he does not indeed run into a small fawn known as Mr. Tumnus. He instead climbs down a shaft into an underground tunnel, and there, instead, he meets a heavily disguised Lord Varys. Varys explains that the tunnel was built for a former hand who wanted to enter Shataya's discreetly. He reassures Tyrion that Chitaya is as trustworthy as can be expected for the times. She has no love for the queen and is grateful to Varys and Tyrion for the removal of Alardim, who murdered baby Bera and her mother. Uh, they eventually emerge into a stable. There, Varys disguises Tyrion as a child and provides him a horse. They discuss Stannis' accusation, and Tyrion wonders where Stannis heard the news. Varys won't be drawn, but points out that all you needed was a pair of eyes. Robert's eight gnome bastards were all ravens, but his three children are all golden. Made no sense. Tyrion is secretly on his way to see Shay, and is very grateful for Varys' help, but still isn't sure if he is friend or foe. Varys says he feels the same about Tyrion. Mm hmm I can see that. Yeah. Summer Islanders have the best names in the, in the series. Chitaya Chit and Alayaya. And Jalabarzo. Oh, uh, Jalabasha, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yes, they have great names. I love Aliyaya. I, I think Aliyaya. that has replaced Jalabarzo as my uh, yeah. favorite name in the show. It is, it is very nice. What was what was the one before the the, the lady who ate the uh, the lady who owned the inn at the crossroads? Oh, uh, Masha Heddle. Masha Heddle, yes, that's right. <laughs> thank you, thank you, external memory drive. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so the letters, they, they, they get two letters that they're uh, all examining in, in this small council meeting. And these two letters were uh, sent on to them from Houses Stokeworth and House, uh, House Stokeworth and House Rosby. And, uh, you know, Littlefinger points out that if those two houses had heard the news, then everybody has heard the news at this point. Right. So. It's, it's, it's not like the Martells and the uh, Tyrells are reporting this news. This is the, yeah. the, the, the small folk of the Lords. Right, as yes. Well. Yeah. And as close geographically to uh, King's Landing as you could possibly get as far as uh, small towns and castles go. Right, right. Uh, Stokeworth, I believe, is the closest, and Rosby is just, <sighs> just past it. So but... uh, that's that's interesting. It's I, I, I hadn't thought about that. So in actual fact, there's a sense that maybe everyone's going to report this to King's Landing because they would get it there first. In fact, oh, they would right. be some of the first to hear because they're closest to Dragonstone, too. True. And yes. then first report it to King's Landing. So maybe everyone thinks they're going to curry favor with the Queen by reporting this to her. But I think that might backfire. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> The, the 17th person to come in and say, do you know what they're saying about you? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, I do. It, maybe uh, she won't be able to crush the uh, the Smith's hands anymore, but she might crush that person's hand. <laughs> just, yes. just for reporting that. <laughs> now, we've met both uh, the Stokeworths and Rosbys at this point. Um, uh, let me guess. Fact, let me guess. Uh, Peter Baelish was having dinner with Stokeworth. Yes, with yes. Tanda Stokeworth and Tanda Stokeworth, uh, his daughters. Yes. Yeah, or yes. her daughters, I mean. Yes, exactly. And uh, she's actually here in the Red Keep. She's calling to Tyrion as he is, as the description says, right. waddling yes. away as fast as he can. Uh, so she is real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now we did she, have some speculation about it. I, I'm wondering if maybe she was, she brought it in person so that she could maybe hear some gossip about, uh, you know, what's being, what the Red Keep's take on the whole thing is. So, so the stoke was sent news to her, and she brought it to the small council. Well, yeah, her maester probably, you know, got it, showed it to her, and she's like, "Oh, I'll deliver deliver this in person. Let's hear what they're saying about it at the Red Keep." Yeah, but but wait, but surely this news went to her hometown, not to King's Landing. Yes, I don't know if she was at home when it came there, and then she traveled well, to King's. Yeah, I guess it's not far, right? But she right. she was in King's Landing, and she's in King's Landing again, so I'm assuming she's been there the whole time. Good point. She may have never left. 
She's yeah. just she's just trying to get some gossip, possibly. Yeah. And uh, uh, Giles Rosby, he both both of them, I believe, were at the Joff's last uh, name day tourney that didn't go very well. That's the price of living close by. Yes. It's much harder to say no to things you really don't want to go to. You know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this they wanted to be at. <laughs> they wanted to see Cersei's face, but Joffrey's right. name day. Yeah. And in fact, way back in Ned 13 of A Game of Thrones, that's the one uh, where Robert was, um, where Ned found out that Robert was mortally wounded and Littlefinger was, they were discussing, you know, what to do now. Littlefinger actually named, uh, Tanda Stokeworth in the in a list of possible allies for Ned against the Lannisters. He didn't give any particular reason for it. He he mentioned Renly. He mentioned a few other houses that were in town, and he, one of them was uh, the Stokeworths. So perhaps his dinners with her had created a loyalty to him oh, that he yeah. thought he could cash in for whoever, whichever side. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Could be. Um, the way you said that, by the way, you said Ned 13 from um, A Game of Thrones, which is the one where, as if Game of Thrones, you were about to describe what happened in A Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first book. <laughs> <laughs> Starts at the wall. And <laughs> Poor Garrod. <laughs> so Cersei so wants any person speaking of incest or calling Joffrey a bastard to lose their tongue. Um, doesn't seem like the smartest thing as... I think it might be Tyrion himself points out, or it could be, you have to correct me if I'm wrong on that. People who remove someone's tongs do it because they're afraid of what that person might say. Yes, that was and Tyrion that said that. Yep. It was Tyrion that said that. And if, if, if you just ignore this, this goes away. It's just the latest gossip. It's just a right. Facebook fad. That yeah. will have its moment in the sun and disappear. Take a breath, swallow your anger, and... Just don't respond. Don't react. That's probably the best way. It's not how they ultimately end up doing it, but that might have been the best way is to just ignore it. But uh, yeah, you know, is she? It's just an. It's a rather poorly thought out political blunder, and she seems to be on a string of those lately. Like back in Sansa Five of Game of Thrones, when she consolidated all the small council positions with basically Lannisters and. Lannister loyalists like Slint, the Hound, booting out Selmy and bringing in Jaime, rather than, you know, building a small council that might provide intelligent but differing views so that, you, you know, you get all all points of view so you can make a well-rounded decision. Yeah, it, it's an interesting point, actually, because because I think maybe because I've known Cersei a long time, I sort of see You go her way being, back. <laughs> but yeah. Um, I see her as being very smart and scheming, but in actual fact, with one notable exception, she's been rash and reactive throughout. Yes. Basically, she's had she's done very little strategic thinking. It's all been sort of like responding dramatically to things which you might be better off not responding dramatically to. For instance, Killing Lady is an example that I always go back to. Right. That created significant tension between her and the Starks and it just didn't need to happen I mean right. Lady was literally innocent of the crime and you were just doing it to be spiteful and that spite always set the Starks against you and always would right. so so when she when she did try to be a little bit more strategic and try to coax Ned round to her side he was already lost to her Yes, he was right, always yeah. going to remember the fact that he'd put Lady to death on her uh, her demand I am nodding and vigorously here in agreement with everything you're the saying. one thing I, the one thing i will say that she outplayed everybody was in the reaction to robert's death and her recruiting the gold cloaks to her side now she may have got a lot of help from littlefinger in that right and that's why she got that one right but she certainly got that one right yes hey, yes absolutely and it was she, the most important one she faced and she nailed it she also did a really good job of wooing sansa on, onto her side but that well but then, but then again, you see, she wanted to woo Sansa, but she killed Lady. Right. The fact she that was, she was still able to woo Sansa after killing Lady does show right. some level of <laughs> cunning. Um, right. Yeah. But but you know you you you're playing defense at that point. You know. Right. Yeah. Sansa was totally in her camp before the killing of Lady. Yeah. If if you go through some of her decisions, uh, as, you know, beyond killing Lady, the whole 
story of Ned being drunk in a brothel that led to the fight with Jamie. I mean, come on. That's that's as terrible a lie as you could possibly think of. (laughs) There's two things you're not going to find Ned Stark doing. Uh, Spending time in a brothel and being drunk and spending time in a brothel. So... uh, but that that could be because there's a secret door in and out of Chitara. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it was a previous hand. I'm just uh-huh, I'm not saying uh-huh, it wasn't uh-huh. there, you know. Yeah, it makes perfect sense now. Uh then, you know, killing the the bastard children of Roberts and uh you know, just in this chapter she threatens the Smiths to uh crush their hands and now cutting out people's tongues, she she just like uh, she I think she has trouble controlling her emo- initial emotional response to something that angers her. Yeah, yeah. The the killing of the bastards could be strategically prudent, but it is short term tactically very poor. I mean, you're you're you know you're in a battle for the throne. The one thing you want to do is try to keep the people on your side and going around murdering children in the streets is uh, yeah, not going to help with that. Not very much, no. But then we've got Grandmaster Pycelle nodding away and saying that's prudent <laughs> measure when she says let's cut out their tongues. And I was like, isn't this guy on the small council because he is the Grand Maester? He's supposed to be one of the most learned and intelligent people in all the Seven Kingdoms? And... Uh, he he basically just agrees with whoever's in charge at the time, which in, on one hand is kind of wise, but yes, but the council is not wise. <laughs> no, the council is no wiser for his presence. That's for right. Sure. <laughs> but I think certainly this council, uh, well, a- apart from Tyrion, this council wasn't looking for uh, dissenting voices. This was supposed to be an echo chamber of what Cersei wanted. Yeah, yeah. Luckily, uh, Littlefinger had a different idea which I guess we'll get to shortly. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's nice of Tyrion to have Cersei's back here, because, of course, I mean, he literally knows that Stannis' accusations are... Well, does he know that every aspect of them is true? I often forget who knows what here. We know that he knows, and we know that she knows, Cersei knows, that Tyrion knows, because of the discussion they had in Tyrion 1. And she, of course, herself knows, she knows completely, that every facet of this accusation is true. Yes. <laughs> because because between her conversations with Tyrion and her conversation with Ned, she's admitted to every single part of this. So it's all true. But Tyrion has her back. You know, he says that the reason we can ignore this is because Tyrion, Stannis can't offer any proof. And he can't offer any proof because it's not true. Right. Which is a good way to put it. He, he should be, I can see him in a legal drama, Tyrion. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, uh, he's he's definitely going to bat for her here. And I wondered if the roles were reversed, if she would have backed him like that. And I don't know. I don't know that she would have, uh, but I don't know that she wouldn't have. I don't think she would have. From our assessment of a few minutes ago of Cersei's uh, strategic thinking, if Tyrion was king regent, I wouldn't have Cersei as my hand of the king. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just... <laughs> the council's not always very solid there. <laughs> right. <laughs> but then again, when does the general population really need proof to believe something salacious about their leaders? You know? No, exactly. <laughs> Good, point. Good and, point. And the plan that they come up with certainly doesn't have any proof to go along with it. So you can't right. get too right. bogged down in details and truths. Right. And in many ways, you've got to imagine, I mean, if if you're trying to get the people on board, this idea of Littlefingers is excellent because it totally, it just gazumps that story with something more salacious and uh, (laughs) exciting, you know. Now, so just to spell the, the plan out, what they're going to do is claim that while Stannis was in King's Landing on... Uh, his brother Robert Small Council. He was the master of ships on the Small Council at the time, in case you were curious. Man, Stannis has always been disrespected by his big brother, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's I mean, he should have been Hand of the King. Yeah. <laughs> well, John Aaron was Hand of the King, but then, you know, Stannis thought when John died, he would be named Hand of the King, and instead he traipsed almost the entire way across the realm to his buddy Ned. So, yeah, he mentioned that in the prologue, I think, that that really burned his britches. Yeah. Uh, but so, while Stannis was in King's Landing, 
the story that they're going to come up with is that Selyse was back on Dragon Stone getting pregnant from Patchface. That's the... <sighs> Which is why Patchface is so fond of Shireen, because she's he's really her father. Right, that's... Little, Littlefinger mentions the... that it works well because the two are always together, Patchface right. and Shireen. And... And Shireen has a patchy face. Yes. So yes, man, exactly. Just, it's perfect. I, I mean, I do like this juicy um, accusation that they're concocting, but Tyrion's very impressed by it. I'm only so impressed because the thing is, when Team A accuses Team B of something, uh-huh. and then Team B goes back, turns around, and accuses Team A of essentially the same thing. Right. It sounds like they're just playing copycat. Though yeah. it sounds like they don't have any evidence. <laughs> I mean, it takes. It would take a very brave person to be an incestuous parent and to shout to the world, that guy over there, that, that lady over there has had sex with her brother and the, her, all her children are the children of incest. When you yourself are a parent of incest. Right. People wouldn't do that. Now, the other way around, a non-parent of incest might accuse an incestuous person of committing incest. But if that incestuous person turns around and says it, it just doesn't sound. It just doesn't sound true. It sounds yeah. hollow. They the might as well thing. might as well have said, "I'm rubber, you're glue." Will you say bounces <laughs> off of me and sticks to you? <laughs> right, right. That would be about as good. But yeah. it is juicy. I will. I will say it will vie in the taverns for which is the story that people like to talk, to retell the most. Yes. But it may fuel the original story too. Yeah. Right. 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 It might. Well, well, I heard. Oh, well, I heard. Might keep right. that going longer, which exactly. is why you probably best off just not doing or saying anything. But but the flip side of the, the the pro of what you just said is, if the two stories reach your ears at the same time, you don't know which one was first. Right. That's you a know? good point. So, yeah. Yeah. So basically, to to the small folk, it becomes a wash. You know. Okay, I don't believe either of these things. Move yes. On. Right. 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 Maybe. Yeah, but. Uh, one thing this chapter makes clear is that with the absence of uh, Sir Barris and Selmy from the small council, there's just nobody left for, to argue from a, a position of honor. It's all just schemers and plotters. Yep. And uh, yep. uh, I, was, I was thinking if Selmy was still on the small council, he might be like, is that offer for the keep north of Castle Rock still, <laughs> <laughs> still on the table? I think I'm ready. <laughs> this yeah. is ridiculous. That's good. Uh, I will say, full marks to Cersei for getting on her high horse about this accusation when she knows full well that it's completely true. I mean, that, that's, that's good acting that yes. this character is performing here. <laughs> Tyrion, it, it's, it's not lost on Tyrion either. He yeah. says, you know, if we lose this war, she should consider a career in mummery because she's fantastic <laughs> at it. But I do understand her desire to keep the news from Joffrey and Tywin. I mean, oh, yes. def- definitely wouldn't want either of those two people to hear it. But right. Tywin, Tywin being the kind of person he is, I think he has, he, he, I, I think he can compartmentalize this and say, OK, I've heard that. I'm just going to ring fence it in. News that I've heard that I'm going to choose not to ever acknowledge, you know. Yeah, I was going to ask you if you thought it's possible that he might have an inkling about this. And that's the thing. I think the reason it goes into that category in his brain is because he would have an inkling that it was true. Yeah, depending on how much time he spends around them. But yeah, I mean, you know. they, they, They grew up together. They were twins, right? So they spent a lot of time together. He would have noticed how close they were, you know. Yeah. And... The kids look, look like Lannisters, you know. I, 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 I would think that he would immediately react, even if he'd never thought of it before. When he hears the rumor, he would be like, "Yeah, that might be true," and then go, "Okay." <laughs> Ooh, to, I could yeah. see how that could <laughs> yeah. be possible. But then, just put it aside in his brain and never think of it again, because that's how he would react to it. I think. Yes, I could see that. Yeah. Now, of course. Tyrion doesn't think that it's true. That that conversation we were talking about in Tyrion 1 between Cersei and Tyrion, when he divulges that he knows about it, he says, you think I'm as blind as father. Right. So, you know, he thinks father is... It, maybe he maybe he means father's turning a blind eye to it. Right. It's, he's consciously blind of it, not unconsciously. Right. Yeah. Now, Tyrion also says that, that this is... 
false. You know, obviously he's backing Cersei. He says it's false, but he says, but what did you expect Stannis to say? He needs to have a reason to claim the Iron Throne. He can't say, well, my nephew Joffrey is the true heir, but I'm going to take the throne anyway. Right. And, that, uh, that, that is the one thing about this. It is terribly convenient for someone who wants to claim the throne, yeah. that the <laughs> one piece of news that he's got to share with the world is the only thing you could possibly say that would give you a right to the throne. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, isn't that convenient story? Yeah. Now, of course, uh, Renly has decided that you don't need any clan of claim to the throne to well, actually call yourself a king. To be fair to Renly, his claim is the same as Stannis's, and that he's not Stannis. That is his claim from top to bottom. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody else deserves it more than me. I'm claiming it. <laughs> I know Stannis is my older brother, and by all rights in the kingdom, it should go to him. But people like me better, so... Yeah, come on, look around. <laughs> <laughs> hands up who wants Stannis. No, I see no, no hands. Huh? Yeah, I mean, uh, they should put it to a democratic vote. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> so Littlefinger decides that they'll spread the Stannis uh, being a cuckold rumor from his brothels, which is that's a smart idea that will... Uh, get it into the heads of people who will share it on with, you know, they'll gossip about it. Right. But it'll be hard to trace it back to where it came from. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, it's a it's a really good idea. I, I agree with yeah. that. Uh, of course, we know that he owned brothels because he took Ned to meet Cat when Cat came secretly to King's Landing uh, to a brothel, and Ned almost killed him for it when he thought it was some sort of a joke that Ned, that uh, Littlefinger was taking him to a brothel to meet his wife. Right. <laughs> so um, so the, the other thing that they focus on in the accusation letter from Stannis is is this reference to uh, In the Light of the Lord, which hints at, Pycel confirms that this sounds like uh, the Essos uh, uh, Red Lord religion of Relor. Right. And this could be more problematic than Shireen's parentage. Because first of all, it literally doesn't matter what Shireen's parentage is. That's right. not his claim to the throne. Yes. Shireen could be Pat Face's child. It doesn't change that Stannis is the rightful king. Yep. It yes. would make her assumption of the throne on the death of her father more problematic, but that's for another day. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, they didn't even discuss how that doesn't in any way discredit his claim to the throne. Right, yes. <laughs> um, the second part is... The second reason that it might be problematic for Stannis is that the support or otherwise of the High Septon can make or break a claimant to the Iron Throne. Um, the right. early oh, Targaryens yes. had a lot of problems because of their marrying their sisters. They had a yes. lot of problems uh, with the with the uh, faith of the Seven, and that led to significant uprisings of the small folk against them because they were hearing it in the churches. Yeah, right. They were hearing that these people were, were sinners. Uh, Aegon the Conqueror's son, Aenys, uh, he faced serious backlash when his children married incestuously, uh, Aegon and uh, Reyna, and that caused the faith to rise up against Aenys and the kids, and uh, then the more pious lords and, and even many of the small folk followed suit. His children ended up being besieged, and uh, he died a broken man of all places, on Dragonstone. So Stannis right, might want right. to uh, learn, uh, reread his history lessons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and Davos has had this thought as well, that, you know, he already has the least support of the claimants to the throne. And so uh, rubbing up against the primary religion of the realm is not going to help. Yeah. And, you know, when he brought it up to Stannis, Stannis's rationale was that his best weapon, Stannis's best weapon, is the fear generated by the unknown of uh, Melisandre and he plans to use that to his advantage but to but for those who haven't met her or have no clue who she is it's not a very useful benefit so it just right yeah you know to the average lord or you know even to a further extent small folk they don't know who Melisandre is or what she can do so it, just, it makes wasn't you wonder very well about thought out yeah, it makes you wonder about including that line in the letter. It feels like that was totally unnecessary. Oh, yeah. And and he was subtle enough not to say it directly, but unsubtle enough that everyone knows what he's talking about. Right, yeah. You wonder if he was afraid if he didn't put it in there, 
that Melisandre might be offended, but didn't come across as as that was the issue. Like, I, I don't want to ruffle feathers with her, so I'm going to throw this in here. In this right. Scene. Yeah, it doesn't feel like he thinks those kinds of thoughts very often, to be honest. No. But, but you are character. raising a good point, yeah. Um, so Tyrion leaves the small council and uh, goes to see the master armorers and basically shows them three links of a chain and he wants thousands more just like it. Um, this chain would be huge. I mean, these, these links are big, heavy, Hunking links, so yes. a thousand chain, a thousand links like that would be, you know, we're talking like a miles long, right? What are they gonna do with a mile long chain? I was thinking, I was thinking about this. Maybe they could wrap it around the city and then put a huge lock to connect the two parts and just, you know, That's lock it. the city. That's in. good. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> or you could drown someone very, very strong. <laughs> right yeah yeah <laughs> or maybe you put it across the road like covered over with like straw and when <laughs> <laughs> someone's coming you yank it and <laughs> yeah that's, yeah yeah that's a possibility I, I do have another idea but i think the other idea is actually what happens so i think i shouldn't say that one because that would be a spoiler rather than a guess but you know me everything's kind of a guess <laughs> Uh, well, re regardless of what it is being used for, he is putting nearly every egg he has in this basket because he has stopped the armors from making armor and weapons for the gold cloaks and the city doesn't have an army. The best they have is the gold cloaks. And so he's investing this, all the steel and iron resources that he has into this mile long very big, heavy chain. So Yeah, which, I mean, clearly that must mean he thinks that this prevents them being besieged and embattled. Yes. Because otherwise, there's, like you say, there, there are better uses for the steel in the city. Something, whatever he has in mind, it must be pretty important, for sure. Yeah. He, yeah. he also says that Littlefinger will find the payment needed for the iron because one of them, one of the uh, smiths says iron's expensive right now how are we supposed to get you know that much iron and coke and he says little finger will find the money but we know the crown is broke so either this is money from the new enter the city tax that we heard about uh, last Tyrion chapter that little finger has instituted or it's being borrowed and i i, I wondered if we know that the uh crown is like millions of gold dragons in debt to the Lannisters. But now it's the Lannisters that are sitting on the Iron Throne. So do they, are they, do they just wipe out that debt, you know? Like, well, we owe it to ourselves. We can't. <laughs> that doesn't real, work out. The real problem here is you don't have anyone to borrow from anymore because basically it's you. So you're like, dang. <sighs> now you become penny pinches. When you're lending to someone, you can be like, ah, I'll lend, give you reasonable interest rates. But when it's you in charge, you're like, so I've inherited a debt to myself. That's great. <laughs> That's just what I needed. Yes. <laughs> but I guess I guess you keep the debt on the books because then you know if you if you go pillage somewhere and make a fortune, you say right. Well, the first six million of that comes to me. Right, you know? going right into my own pocket here. Exactly. <laughs> um, uh, but one thing. So while they're looking at this chain, some of the um, iron workers are are examining the chain, and and one of them who's a uh, a little bit uh, full of himself. He, he's a master armor named Solorian. He says, you know, this making this chain is, is beneath me. I'm a master armor. And let me make a, let me make you some armor with my time, something that's more suitable to your station. And Tyrion replies that he can make this chains or he can wear chains. And I thought just right before that, he, uh, the Smiths had said, oh, well, we can't stop doing what we're doing because Cersei said, if we don't make the uh, armor and swords quota Break that she's put, she's going to smash our hands on her own forge. And he says, he thinks to himself, ah, Cersei, always making the uh, <laughs> small folk love us. And then he, he turns around and threatens them again. <laughs> the, the thing is, unless it's the big chain that they're making, being put in chains would only be temporary. 
you know. I guess so. if it's if it's the big chain, it probably would be pretty permanent. But <laughs> once that thing lands, it's sticking where it landed. <laughs> yeah, good point. Um, so the next thing that Tyrion does is he gets. Uh, we actually got dressed before this, didn't he? But next he does he, he he gets in the litter and goes across the city, looks through the curtains of the litter and sees a lot of angry stares in the streets. Tries to figure out who are the spies. Decides it's the people who are not obviously staring at him <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> angrily. <laughs> it's everybody else. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there's plenty of reason for the small folk to be angry. I mean, the the execution of the bastards is not very nice. Um, yeah, you have to imagine news of that has spread. You know. Yeah, because because the thing is. She didn't send assassins. She sent gold cloaks. Yes, and rummaging through cloaks... the city looking right. for bastards. <laughs> when the gold cloaks kill people, you'd notice that, you know? Right. Um, the tax to enter King's Landing is probably hurting many of the people. Uh, they, you know, until Tyrion arrived, they were building defenses and they weren't keeping the people fed. But Tyrion has reversed some of that. Yeah. Uh, and then we've got the general population explosion due to the flood of re refugees coming from the Riverlands. And of course, probably many of them are angry at the Lannisters because they bl they're blaming the Lannisters for destroying the Riverlands. Yeah, but do they know? I mean, when... I guess they would know, right? They but would have like... to. You would think. If, if, the, if there are armies in your land destroying and burning and pillaging... You you would think you would yeah. know whose armies it is. Now we do know that Gregor Clegane, when he was doing his um before the war, yeah, yes, he was, he was doing it without banners, right? Right. But now so even I, I, uh, Jamie and Tywin are out there, so. right? Yeah, yeah. But he he has done some good. Him, I mean Tyrion has done some good. Yeah, he mentions that he's building fishing boats. He's opened the King's Wood to hunting to anyone who wants to go across the river into the king's wood uh, and he's even sent the gold cloaks foraging for food so clearly he's a better capable more compassionate leader than cersei her primary concern seemed to be keeping her kids and herself safe which is you know at some understandable. level understandable yeah. of course yeah. but with absolutely no concern for the well-being of the small folk less understandable yes so you ha you have to imagine that Varys has not mentioned the power riddle to her. Uh, or, or got a very short answer when he did. Yes. <laughs> the king. The king, of course. <laughs> yes. Why are you asking me such stupid questions? <laughs> but I, I just wonder if... I don't know that these measures are going to be enough to impact a city as big and populous as King's Landing as they currently stand you know, doing so building some fishing boats and allowing hunting and, and foraging for some food uh, there might need to be more done at some point maybe some uh, some ma mass ways of feeding large populations you know yeah yeah they, they would be smart to do a bit more pr work but of course because yes. they are now doing good in the city but uh yes yeah there's a few things they could tout you know they could certainly paint Slint as a horrible monster and that he's been removed and replaced by a war hero, Jaceline Bywater. Um, they could, you know, announce, make sure that everybody knows these changes that he, that we just mentioned that he, uh, he Tyrion is doing for the city. And um, maybe, even if it's not true, just, you know, mention some, some of the cutbacks that they're making at the Red Keep. Make it feel like the, the, Royals in the Red Keep are suffering as well. They're they're pinching. They're they're pulling back to help. You know, there's a way to spin these things. I often feel like when we talk about this kind of thing that we are talking about the British royal family, sort of like by analogy, you know, and, and <laughs> right. how they they need to do a better job of their PR. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we know there's plenty of unrest out there, even in Sansa One, which is one of the earliest chapters in this book. Uh, there was so much unrest outside of the Red Keep that they had to hold Joff's name day tournament in the Bailey inside the Red Keep. So it doesn't seem like things are improving a whole lot. And if the if the city were to revolt, you know, like in mass, that would be really bad. It would it pro it's probably a more dangerous situation than either 
of the Baratheon armies if yeah. if they were to, you know, completely storm the castle and uh, you know half a million people <laughs> up in arms. Yeah, especially now that the gold cloaks don't have the armor that they were getting, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> or the swords. <laughs> yeah. so, so they arrive at the brothel, and Tyrion makes to go inside. He doesn't tell Bronn exactly what he's up to, and he invites Bronn and the uh, uh, it's the Black Ears that are escorting him to go and use some of the cheaper brothels down the other end of the street. So he's yes. actually keeping this whole thing a secret from everyone. Yeah, it makes sense on, on some levels. I mean, he knows that that Braun is a sellsword. And so maybe he thinks, yeah, I trust him enough to do certain tasks, but not enough to give him valuable information that if he wanted to, he could sell me out with. I wonder though, if it's a little bit simpler than that. I wonder if he just knows that from the brothel, he's going to move, he's going to ride across the city to Shay's house, that he doesn't want to be with Braun for that. He wants to be, in disguise, incognito, whereas Bronn would sort of stand out. He's a big, strong cell, so harder yeah, to disguise him. Definitely. But Bronn, he could have let Bronn know, okay, I'm going in here, I'm going to disappear, and I'm going to end up at Shays, and then I'll be back later. But he, right. he pretends like he's interested in the actual prostitutes in this brothel. Yeah. So, But then maybe he doesn't want to say that because he knows the little birds are listening, you know. But anyway, Varys already knows. Yes. Varys is the one, <laughs> the, the least trustworthy person is the person who knows everything. <laughs> Good point. Um, he does consider twice that about um, whether Joffrey's of age to get a prostitute. Um, yeah, curious thing to twice mentally reference. Yeah, but I mean, one of the times is because he says this is the brothel that the king frequents, and then sort of like somebody yeah. asks. Bronn says, "Yeah, it, the boys of age." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So he didn't he didn't consciously think of it, but then the idea came to him that you know, maybe he is. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we we had met Chataya previously because ba Baby Barra was born to one of her prostitutes, but then Baby Barra was. Murdered by Aladim, who worked for uh, Janna Slint in the Gold Cloaks. Va uh, Varys thinks she's trustworthy because she doesn't love the Queen, and apparently she knows that Aladim's removal to the Watch or the bottom of the ocean, depending on which one happened, um, <laughs> was orchestrated by Tyrion. So she's got a debt to Tyrion for that. Yes, right, right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, gives so her definitely allegiance to him. So this tunnel level. was built by a hand of the king. I'm sticking with Ned. Definitely yeah. feels like a <laughs> Ned Stark thing. <laughs> All right, so you got you got Ned. It 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 sounds a little bit beneath John Arryn too. I mean, it's a tunnel. It's beneath everyone. But um, <laughs> cheap <laughs> gag. You got those are um, the best. The four hands prior to John were all very brief, so oh, either they right. were laser focused, <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> I am never stepping over the threshold of a brothel, so I need you to start digging. <laughs> um, oh, and so the one before that was Tywin Lannister, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it's a very interesting idea that it um, yeah. that it could have been Tywin because we. We know he certainly has issues with Tyrion's uh, brothel frequenting and right. specifically forbade him from bringing Shay to town. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's definitely ironic that it might have been him that had this tunnel put in. And yeah. he was and definitely in uh, in town long enough to long have had enough something like this. Right, yeah. exactly. And I, I also think it fits with his character, the, the sort of like wanting to protect the Lannister reputation. Sure. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. So he, Tyrion goes into this wardrobe and he does not meet Mr. Tumnus and he goes down this ladder and he meets Varys and uh, Varys is dressed in a uh, spiked steel cap and he's wearing uh, leather armor type stuff and he's got a scarred face and a, a stubble of a beard, which is almost exactly how he was described in the dungeons of the Red Keep when Arya was spying on him and Lyra Mopatis. So, uh, must be one of his go-to right, right. uh, looks, I the, guess. The way you described it, it sounded a little bit like the village people. I've got to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, so th then they start discussing um, 
the roots of Stannis's accusation of the incest between Jamie and Cersei. And uh, Varys says that, you know, he could have read a book and looked at the color of the bastard's hair, a la uh, Ned and John Aaron before him. And he said, or maybe someone whispered in his ear. And, you know, the hair color thing might be proof that the kids aren't Baratheons, but not necessarily of incest. There's plenty right. of blondes in the Lannister family that weren't product of incest. So Right, yeah. Yeah. And and plenty of people who you could breed with who wouldn't lead to a dark haired child. Right. Yes, exactly. So and and then we learn here that uh King Robert fathered eight known bastards, at least known to Varys. Now, he doesn't say whether that's eight in King's Landing or eight total. We know of two in King's Landing, and we know of two outside of King's Landing. We know Gendry and Barra in King's right. Landing, and Maya Stone and Edric Storm outside of King's Landing. So right. there's at least four more out there somewhere. Um, yeah, and he says that they're... Um... The kids were all; those kids were all black as ravens and as ill omened. It would seem. Uh, so ravens are potentially black bad luck. We've heard dark, dark word, dark winds, dark, dark wings, wings dark, dark words. words. Yes. yes. Um, but does it also mean that the mothers didn't survive? I guess Barra's mother survived. Barra's mother didn't survive. Alardim. Didn't oh, mean, he didn't plan right. on killing her, but he did kill her because right. she fought back. Right. <laughs> Tyrion said, "You know, mothers and children, and their mothers yeah. and their children." <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah, but 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 Edric and Meyer are still alive and safe, so it's not bad luck for all of them, right? But. But where are these other four? I mean, maybe that's the thing. Maybe we've just been skipping over the fact that several dark haired children have been murdered in King's Landing. Yes, it's possible we only heard about baby Barra because yeah. we'd met Barra. Yeah. But then Tyrion has a thought that uh, I kind of like this. Uh, he says, he thinks to himself, if Cersei had just had one child from her husband, Robert, that it might have been enough to throw people off the scent because it would, there would have been one dark-haired kid in the brood. But then he thinks that would be too un like to think something yeah. through like that. And back when Ned confronted her about the, all of this, about uh, the you know that he was going to tell Robert about the incest and the kids not being his, and he was giving her time to flee. She mentioned that she was she did once get pregnant by Robert, but that Jamie found a woman to abort the pregnancy. So I just wondered if, if she had had a child with Robert, maybe even the fourth child, would she been able to love it the way she loves the other three? Because one thing about Cersei, all faults aside, she definitely loves her kids yeah, fiercely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I suspect she wouldn't. I suspect she, I suspect she would not love that child as much, just because she's so in love with Jamie. You know, yeah. But his children would always be more precious to her than Robert's, and the Robert yeah. one, particularly if it looked like Robert, which apparently it would, <laughs> yes. spitting image, <laughs> would always remind her of him. And yes, that, could that was what I was thinking too. Yeah. The other thing is, I think that that might backfire. Just the whole idea of having one Baratheon child in amongst them, because it would make the others look even more Lannister. If they all yeah. come out blonde, you could just say, well, the egg is strong, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but if right. one came out Baratheon, you'd be like, well, I don't know what the heck's going on here. <laughs> Basically, um, looking at who the traitor is in terms of getting this news to Stannis. Right. Um, Littlefinger's name is thrown out, um, but we don't know who tipped off whom. We don't know whether Stannis and John Arryn knew the same things at the same time, or one was leading the other, or yeah. third parties were involved, such as Littlefinger and Varys. We are right. We definitely know that Stannis and John Arryn went to visit Gendry together and together. Baby Barra yeah, together. So they were yeah. definitely doing some sort of investigation together. Whether they were together long enough to come to the same conclusion together is not known yet. But it, yeah. Littlefinger was definitely clever enough to put the pieces together of true born children versus bastard children versus incest, ancestral children. So 
Yeah. It definitely could have been him without um, being told by John Aaron or Stannis. I wonder if Varys himself is a suspect here as well. I mean, like, because is it treason? Is it, I mean, it's treasonous towards Cersei, but it's not treasonous towards the realm to tell Stannis that Cersei's children are not robbers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That makes yeah, sense. And, and that, that's always his claim that he's loyal to right, the realm. Right, that he's, he, right, he serves the realm. But one thing about Littlefinger is that he gave Ned very specific and valid reasons why he didn't want Stannis on the Iron Throne. First of all, he said he'd fire the entire small council, which right, yeah. is definitely would have been a big deal for him. Second, he said he's unben- unbending and that he will cause revolt and bloodshed in the realm. So we do know, though, that he likes to stir up trouble. At least right. we suspect he right. likes to stir up trouble. He might want to, He might have wanted to stir up trouble not expecting it to actually pan out, you know. Again, sure. I think of all the claimants of the throne, the one least likely to ascend the throne is Stannis. He has the smallest army, the least support. Right. It's very difficult to see his path to the throne. Yeah, yeah. Background? All right, let's do some background. Okay, well, way back in Sansa 2 of A Game of Thrones, that was the Hands Tourney chapter, we talked a little bit about the Summer Isles thanks to Jalabarzo's participation in the tourney. And back then, we told you that it's an archipelago found well south of Dorne, made up of more than 50 islands, and it separates the Sunset Sea to the west from the Summer Sea to the east. Well, of the many islands, the three largest are Walano, Umburu, and Jahala, which is, I, I listed those from north to south. And what you might think of as the capital or the hub of the Summer Isles is called Tall Trees Town, where priestesses carve histories and laws into the tall trees that shade the town. The trees are known as talking trees, and various islands contain a wide array of topography ranging from rainforest to sandy beaches to tall mountains. The people of the Summer Isles speak a language known as the Summer Tongue, and worship a bunch of gods, and fittingly for this chapter, the god and goddess of love, beauty, and fertility being the most favored. Uh, the talking trees record a history that goes back thousands of years. Uh, even whole older history is recorded through a complicated method of mem- memorizing and passing down oral histories. In a Westerosi maester named Gallard managed to record some of these oral histories in a book called Children of Summer. Based on their recorded history, both oral and etched into the talking trees, the Summer Islanders were unaware of their larger world around them for a very long time. The older maps on the talking trees show the Summer Isles surrounded by nothing but ocean. Yeah, I mean, it, fa- it feels like they're pretty remote, so the, those maps weren't that wrong. I mean, you had to go a right. long way away. <laughs> You'd have to draw quite a small map to get all the way to the, to the rest of the world, but yeah. True. They're Very tall trees. They, they didn't say how tall these trees were. Maybe they didn't have the space <laughs> on the bark. <laughs> Thank you for that. So in comparison with the television show, the primary difference here is the way Shay is hidden. The book has her in a remote manse, but the TV show wanted her closer to the action. So Varys helps sec- her secure a job as handmaiden to Sansa Stark. Uh, quite clever in that it gives Tyrion both a spy into the Sansa Joffrey dealings, but also gives him a conflicted gratitude to Varys. They're, they're, you know, they... They were both in on that. Um, huh. He's still worried for her, but glad she's got a cover story. So no Chataya, no tunnels, none of that stuff. Okay. Um, the earlier part of the chapter, the whole discussion of Stannis' claim appears to be missing too. I couldn't find it anywhere. I looked up and down several episodes. Um, I did finally find Varys and Tyrion discussing the riddle of the pow- of power. So that did actually happen in the end. Um, it was late in episode four. Um, I think the small council scene was co-opted into the scene in which they discuss and dismiss Rob Stark's demands. That was a scene we did have in the TV show that we didn't have in the book. So right, at least not funny. yet anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Question. Pod Podrick Payne is mentioned as being 12 years old in this chapter. They did the the age progression on him as well, right? He was played by an adult. Yeah, I mean a young adult. I mean, I think the kid was like nineteen or twenty. But yes, I mean he was he was a definitely not and twelve, <laughs> definitely not twelve. And 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 as his story goes, you'll be grateful for this. 
Yes, I think I know what you're referring to. Um, so pedantry, uh, just an overarching one. If Tyrion is so keen to keep Shay hidden, the one person he should not include in those machinations is Varys. I mean, Varys should be the touchstone. It should be like, does Varys know? And he should keep moving her until he finds a place where he can hide her from Varys. Right, that would be point. <laughs> that would prove she's hidden from everywhere, everyone. Might might involve sending her uh, back to the Riverlands, but <laughs> yeah. I was wondering, so the uh, Varys is is helping Tyrion get disguised as this little boy, and he takes down a saddle and tack from a peg and puts it on this horse. And I was thinking. So does Tyrion need a special saddle, or does he not need a special saddle? I, I guess I maybe it's going small, dis- short distances at a slow pace. He can handle. That's what I was going to say. It's probably it's probably something he can do, but for longer journeys, he wants his special saddle. Yeah, like theoretically, you could throw your baby in the back seat of a car and not put him put exactly. baby in a car seat. Exactly, just not a good idea. It's right. it's definitely a possibility they, of bad danger. They're probably okay until they crawl under the pedals, and then it could be a problem. You know? Right. Yes. <laughs> but but yeah, I mean, it's it's a good point to observe. But I think I think it does make a certain amount of sense. He is basically just a short person. You know, you could right. shorten the stirrups and he could ride. News and notes. Well, uh, today is Amelia Clark News Day. Uh, Amelia Clark, um, Danny. Is that official? Is that official? Is that replacing Earth Day? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, apparently, it's both. It's a, a dual day. So Clark, who played Danny on the TV show, uh, she seems to have a new king. She's um, in the final stages of a deal to join Marvel Studios' uh, show called Secret Invasion which is an original series uh, they're planning for Disney+. Plus. And uh, this, of course, will be her first foray into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Clark has also, she just revealed this on her Instagram page, uh, created a new comic. It's called uh, Mother of Madness, and it, basically it's about a badass single mom superhero. Oh, cool. And uh, it is expected to hit the stands on July 21st. And based on my comprehension of her instagram post she designed and wrote it so there you go yeah i'll take this one this is fascinating all Um, right fabergé have decided to sell a game of thrones dragon egg it'll have diamonds rubies and gold you can open the egg and it has a crown inside yeah sitting on a uh, a little crystal stand the crown will be all yours for a mere 2.2 million us which honestly i mean i can imagine going for that but what my, what I would worry about is my kid throwing it in a fire to see if it's <laughs> <laughs> a dragon. You're going to get a thing. dragon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're going to get something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm cutting off your allowance for the next 200 million years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a good one. You want to read the review? No, I'll let you read. I, I often steal the reviews. You can have this one. All right. Well, um, this review is from Tess Robes and T-E-S-S-R-O-B-S, and it's from Apple Podcast Great Britain. And the subject is, if you can't be bothered to read the book, listen to this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe there aren't more five-star reviews of this show. That's that's Tess Robes, not me. Although I, I do agree. <laughs> I can't <laughs> <wasn't> believe. I... <laughs> it's an absolute gem. Again, reviewer, not me. I've binged my way through 68 episodes, and I have no intention of stopping. I have ADHD and find it really difficult to sit and read the books. But I am crazy in love with the Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire. So having the recap of each chapter, the background, the discussion, and a comparison to the scenes in the show is perfect for me because it means I can do other things in the background. Thanks for doing this podcast. Can't wait until I catch up with the latest episodes, which should be in about two days, given my current binging record. Well, that is really nice. God, these are, these always it? like they always choke me up, you know? I, know. I think one thing I should say to Tess Robs is that vacuuming, I think, is the de rigueur thing that one should do whilst listening. Right. I, I yeah. do a lot of cooking listening to us. I've, I've been I've been re-listening to some old ones. I've been, I, oh, okay. Uh, but I was cool. back at like. I'm actually in the build-up to episode 50. Oh, it got me thinking, actually. I had an idea for episode 100. Oh. I have the wives on. 
<laughs> I don't think we can stretch that to a full episode because they won't sit still for a full oh, episode. Oh, no, no. But we no. could have like a five minute conversation with them and see what they have to say about us. Uh huh. Interesting. I will run that by Stacy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll run it by Carson's agent. Yes, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, I was actually um I was talking over Instagram to a listener who um is a pizza delivery person in I believe Sweden. So, you know, there's all kinds of tasks that people do while listening to us. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, any kind of delivery thing. Yeah, that's a, that's a good choice. Yeah. It's probably yeah. best to do something else while listening to us. I mean, yeah. We're yeah, not I mean, that engaging. <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously, a quiet, dark room where you can just really focus is obviously Eyes preferable. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's conclude because we have gone yeah. on for hours. The word yeah. is out. Even the Stokeworths know. <laughs> but hey, they're tight with Littlefinger. They're going to know some things, you know. That's right. Yeah. Well, I mean, what else is the point of hanging around with Littlefinger if not to get right. uh, such gossip? But how will certain people react, such as how would Dad react if he, in fact, doesn't know yet? Yeah. I think your, your thought of him mentally compartmentalizing it and then shoving it away in a dark corner of his mind is, is probably... A very distinct possibility. And, and perhaps more pertinently, how is the realm going to react to this news? I mean, is it... I, I guess if they put out a counter-rumor, then probably they'll just cancel each other out and... Right. Will come That's possible. It. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, but, but, but maybe people works won't on the, care. Yeah. Know? That only works on the small <laughs> folk, though, because the, 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 the lords have all received this letter from Stannis, and it's written in earnest, you know? It's right. convenient, self-serving, doesn't mean it's not true. Yeah, all good points. Yeah, and can Cersei keep it from keep this secret from Joffrey? Yeah, it seems like it. it. Seems like you know, the king kings tend to live in a bubble in a lot yeah. of ways. So yeah. now we know Varys said Tyrion asked him if it was him that uh, was whispering in Stannis's ear. He said, "Why betray a secret I've kept so long?" Uh, it's one thing to deceive a king, another to hide from the crickets in the rushes, a, a little bird in the chimney, which I, I think what he's trying to say is it's easy to keep a secret from a singular king. It's hard to keep it from everyone else. So everyone. there might have been a lot of people yeah. that could have known this and spread this to Stannis. Yeah. And uh, Renly's will have heard this news now, but what I mean, Renly doesn't need to hear this news. He knows Stannis is a claimant to the Iron Throne. Uh <laughs> So what should he do? Obviously, what he should do is make common cause with Stannis. Yes, absolutely. I wanted to get into a whole discussion about that, but I knew we weren't going to have the time. So we'll save it for another chapter. But yes, I agree with you. This will bubble up. This will bubble up. Yeah. So I'm always interested, you know, this the intersection between politics and religion. I think Stannis has perhaps made a gaffe tipping his hand about his conversion to the new religion. Uh, yes, we'll see. We'll see. Especially when he fully admitted to Davos that he really doesn't believe in gods in general. So it wasn't even done because he truly believed it. He was he yeah. put it in there yeah, because yeah. he wanted people to fear Melisandre. But people don't know Melisandre, so how are they supposed yeah. to fear her? Yeah. Um, Tyrion has set up quite a rigmarole to get to visit Shay. It was an hour in a litter to Chitayas, then. A whole mummers show in Chitayas, right. then claw- crawling down the tunnel, down through the wardrobe, down the tunnel, through, right. through the uh, fur coats, and down, <laughs> the, down the tunnel. Then a horse ride back across the city to get to Shay. I'm not sure that's sustainable. Yeah, it certainly feels uh, more involved than um, him bringing her just to spite his father. Yeah, you know, well, like yeah. Uh... So I think he's fond of her. That's definitely sure. a lot of strong emotions involved here because that's quite the effort. Yeah, he he's literally in a brothel, yeah. and then leaves the brothel and has to go through a whole another second half of his routine. It reminds me of, um, I mean, I used to travel on business quite a bit, and and I could never get Carson to come and pick me up at the airport, <laughs> which is. 20 minutes down the road. <laughs> we don't live that far away. <laughs> which, which in turn reminds me of a joke that D.L. Hughley told, which I think I've probably told you. There was a story 
it's got to be more than 10 years ago now, where a woman, a woman freed her lover from jail. Um, he was being transferred and she drove into the transfer in an SUV and sprung him somehow. And I, th- oh, I think okay. two people were killed. And, oh, no. And th- the story was weird because all kinds of things happened after that. But she, so she did that. And I think she shot at people and she rammed them and she got him out of there and she, they drove off and there's a big car chase kind of thing. And he said, I can't get my wife to pick me up at the airport. Look <laughs> what this woman is doing for her, man. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. I've, I've totally inserted a joke at the wrong moment. We're just getting out of here. But things um, are definitely getting dangerous in King's Landing. It's uh, definitely a powder keg. The small folk are not happy with the lords. Right. And, and there's a lot of small folk in King's Landing. Yeah. It's a very populous city, growing more populous by the day. Uh, yeah, which is only adding to the unhappiness. Yes. Uh, yeah. Maybe the crown needs a better uh, public relations manager. Shout out yeah. any good deeds that they're doing, um, and, and along with any of these salacious rumors that they're about to put out against there. their enemies. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yes. All right. As always, you can reach us at ghost.harrenhall at gmail.com and follow us on Twitter at Ghost Harren Hall. We're on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and ever so excitingly, we're on Discord, which is great. That's we're right. having fun there. We are having a lot of fun. And if you wouldn't mind going out and leaving us a five-star rate and or a glowing review, much as Tess Robes did, we certainly would appreciate that, and we might read it in a future episode. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye. Bye.